You're listening to episode 145 of the D6 Podcast. I don't know anything more important in our society or in the kingdom of God than to help the church, help the family. Discipleship is not an event, it's a way of life. And one day it just hit me that discipleship at home was not about doing more. It was about inviting Christ into what we were already doing. The goal of family ministry is not families sitting on the couch, holding hands and singing Kumbaya. The ultimate goal is families that love God, love people and make disciples of all peoples. So that's why you're here. You're here to say one hour a week, as significant and as awesome as it is, we know that it's not enough and we wanna be intentional with every hour. You're listening to the D6 Podcast. Here's your hosts, Ron Hunter and Jeremy Lee. This is the Family Ministry Podcast that helps you connect the church and home. And today, Ron, we are going to connect with the wise youth ministry legend, Dr. Richard Ross. And he's going to be talking about uh, how to parent teens. And this is one of those that I love to cue our ministers that are listening when they have one that we can share with parents. That's right. This is one of those episodes. Yeah, definitely passing this along, getting them to plug in and listen. This isn't easy. I mean, uh, let's just kind of promote how people can share our podcast. If you see a topic or hear a topic that you think a single family or all of the teenage parents or whatever, how do they go about sharing this, Jeremy, if D6 they want to pass fam- along? D6family.com forward slash podcast is where uh, it lives online. And uh, it's it's a cool little site. I think you guys will like it. Absolutely. And then, of course, also can download the uh, in whatever your app is based on your phone and then search for your uh, episodes. Yeah, it's on Stitcher, iTunes, all the all the places, all That's the right. places. Speaking but, of online resources, I can't go too far because yeah. we want to make sure people know you have a resource that kind of opens and closes. So we got to always make sure we tell people when it's open. While it's so, open. That's right. Because a lot of people are asking and want to know, and it is actually open. So tell us about D6 Plus, because if they want it, they need to jump in and get it. They do. Because if you remember back at Christmas, seeing the lines that are wrapped around Best Buy waiting to get in on Black Friday, you know, when we open up the cart, there are people standing in line waiting to jump back into or jump into for the first time this uh, this opportunity. This is a chance for you to equip your parents, equip Equip your volunteers, be the best trainer, best leader in your church with minimal effort. And this provides coaching for you and your staff. So you got the media vault that Jeremy talked about last week's episode, access to all of the main stage speakers pretty much throughout our entire you know history of the D6 conferences where we've got permission and some audios for our breakouts. And can you imagine if you wanted to gather some parents around and watch Richard Ross or Timothy Paul Jones or Kyle Adelman or whomever. And we've got hundreds, hundreds uh, in that vault. And that could be a service. It could be a small group, whatever you want to do. But have them coaching right there because you don't need to buy them a plane ticket or pay them a speaking fee. If you're a member of D6+, Plus, you have access to numerous speakers. And that's just one facet. There's so many others on this. And there's so much going on because you're opening D6 Plus as part of the celebration of D6 Days. Days. Lots of D6 stuff happening around here. So D6 Days is, if you're listening in real time, it's happening next week. So... We need to. Uh, you need to sign up if you want to be a part of it. That's Tell right. Tell them a little bit about. I know we're saying we don't usually talk this much. No, so we much don't. Is going on. J- just be clear between these two terms. D six plus is a subscription service to some training and some resources. D six days absolutely free. It is a limited time. It is on demand, but there is an open and closed window, which is February 11, 12, and 13. And the reason why we're doing it on demand is so that you can watch when you want to at your convenience. As ministry leaders, you're not always in charge of your schedules. And it gives you a taste of the live D6 conference. That's right. So kids, if you're taking notes at home, we have D6+. Plus. D6 Days Days, and D6 D6 Conference. Conference. And you can hit rewind and learn all about that if you missed it. That's right. But now, after the break, we're going to be talking more uh, with Dr. Richard Ross, and he is going to be encouraging us through that crazy journey we call Parenting Teenagers. We'll talk to you after the break. Scripture. 
Scripture and modern-day research attests to this truth. When one generation commits to and engages in the discipleship of another generation, people of all ages know Jesus and become more like Him. This commitment requires us to say goodbye to the myopic focus on the next generation and instead broaden our view to every generation. Every generation. Moms, dads, grandmas and grandpas, aunts and uncles, kindergartners and middle school students, college freshmen and newlyweds, each one awakened to Jesus Christ and living out a vibrant faith with one another. We invite you to adopt this focus at the D6 Conference, a family ministry event built on the Deuteronomy 6 philosophy of generational discipleship. You will experience three days of strategy, resources, and action steps to help move your church forward together. Discover what's in store at d6conference.com. Well, uh, Dr. Richard Ross, I don't how many months ago, we, just a few months ago, we got to spend a whole day together. What a treasure that was. I got to know you a lot better uh, because you helped us celebrate the 10th anniversary of D6 Conference. That was an exciting day. I Wasn't loved it good? that. Yes. So, and then I've gotten to interview a couple of other times, but every time I, I learn more and more, so I'm excited about today. Those of you who don't know, Dr. Richard Ross is husband to Lawana, who has joined him in a lifetime of loving teenagers. Uh, and their son is Clayton, and I know, uh, man, his story is amazing, and I, I, I wish I, we could do a whole interview on Clayton, couldn't we? <laughs> Just we all that could. he's been through, <laughs> and golly. Uh, Richard served as youth minister for 30 years and now is volunteer with teenagers and parents at Wedgwood Baptist Church in Fort Worth. Many of you might know him as the pastor or the professor to the next generation of youth ministers at Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth. You also may un- know that he was the a uh, spokesperson for the International True Love Waits Movement, and he's written 23 books for youth leaders, parents, and speaks at over 35 conferences and churches each year. How'd I do? Is that good? That was just marvelous. <laughs> so, hey, uh, I've, I've, you are doing a training on parenting teens, and I wanted that to be our theme today. I know that probably doesn't shock you. I'm sure this isn't your first time to talk about it. But I, I just wanted to kind of revisit with you some of these topics and kind of lay down another resource, if you don't mind, for the parents out there that are entering these teenage years, this is a little selfish. I'm, I have now entered into this. My my son is 13, and so it's now it's now go time. So I don't all these cameras and everything is fine, but like help me help me, Dr. Ross, please. So let's start with this. When I have a child in fourth through sixth grade, and they're approaching the teenage years, what are some things I can do to prepare for the teenage years? I think one of the most important things you can do, I know, I know this sounds all churchy, but actually I think it's immensely practical. I think one of the most important things you can do is give a child an identity that is anchored in Christ. And I really mean anchored in Christ. Most of the issues, problems, pitfalls in middle school have to do with the way I see myself, obviously. Sure, yeah. So if you back up to fourth grade and help a child figure out I'm really okay, but I'm okay because the God of the universe designed me before the foundation of the world. I, I really was designed in his mind. The way I am is perfectly fine because he says I'm fine. What happens then, you get fewer juniors in high school that are throwing up after every meal or fewer guys giving themselves shots after football practice. All kinds of things just work out a lot better when, when you end up with a 12-year-old that would just be kind of okay with who they are. And, and they're okay with who they are because they don't feel random. They don't feel like a mistake. They feel like somebody smart figured me out and, and what I'm going to do with my life, how I, how I live my teenage years even, it's a fit. It's a match with the person that I am. I just think that's huge. The other issue may sound a little random, I just think it's a great strategy for a fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, and that is to connect that child with adults. What I'm figuring out is the, the world of peers is brutal in middle school in lots of ways. But, and, of course, that's going to always be a part of a, a child's life. But the kids do well who know how to relate well to adults. They enjoy conversations with adults. They respect adults. They feel comfortable with it. I've just watched those young people. They just 
kind of skate above a lot of other issues, problems, challenges. So I think if you back up in fourth grade and you're kind of, hey, why don't we go sit with this precious senior adult? Or why don't we have somebody over? Or wouldn't it be fun if we did something with? And, and you're just giving that, that, that fourth grader, fifth grader experiences where they're just kind of really good to be around adult people. I think that helps inoculate them uh, for middle school. Mm, that's that's good and practical. Thank you. The uh, front door to adolescence, when we know it's here, we may be wondering if it's there, but we know it's there when puberty comes. Um, as a parent, what do I need to understand about the transition in their uh, minds, bodies, their hearts that goes on when they go through puberty? Okay, take a, take a fourth grader, fifth grader, immensely close ties to parents, you know, in, in a good situation just all tangled up with each other emotionally. It feels good. It's wonderful. Everybody likes it. If you have an 18 or a 19-year-old that is just that emotionally tied to a parent, we would call that person a cripple. We would call that person dysfunctional, which means you, you've got six years to sort of unwind and untangle that, not a loss of love, not a loss of respect, but just those cords that have you so tied together. Okay, God causes mother's bodies to move away from babies in their tummies. The mother's body says, you're leaving. But when you get to age 12, it's the opposite. The parent isn't gently pushing that child away. Now it's the child that's pushing the parent away. It's just in God's order of things. The huge problem is the vast majority of parents, including church parents, start taking that personally. They, they remember, oh, you used to come in and sit in, my, sit in my lap every time you walked in, or you used to come in from school and tell me every single thing that happened to you that day, or nothing was more fun to you than let's go do something with mommy or daddy. And now, all of a sudden, you're wanting to stay in your room a little bit more, or now you're wanting to be with friends and not with me. When parents take that personally and it offends them, they react, I think, in pretty immature ways. They get loud. They, they, it's kind of tit for tat. You don't want to be with me. Well, then I don't want to be with you. You push back on me. I'm going to push back on you. And I've watched this now for, for decades. If it goes wrong at the beginning, they spend the next six years mad at each other, pushing back on each other, being more offended with each other. So the way you, you don't do that is at the very beginning, as a parent, you take a deep breath and say, this is not about me. This is not a rejection of me. This child still loves me, still respects me. And in adulthood, we're going to have a stellar relationship because I'm not going to act like a baby in the midst of all this and get all huffy and mean and start breaking that heart connection, which is fundamental for our relationship. So I think if parents just cut the kids some slack, sweetheart, if you want to be in your room a little bit, that'll be fine. But after dinner, I do want you to spend some time with the family. You know, you, you just modulate that a little bit without blow-ups, without drama, I think everybody comes out a lot better. Mm. And I am in this stage. I've got a 10-year-old and a 13-year-old, and I'm noticing with puberty, like, the, the early bloomer, the late bloomer, that's, that's so uh, significant at this stage, you know, because if, uh, if, if they're an early bloomer, they're more developed, they're more confident. Uh, if, they're, if, they're, or if, they're a, if they're a late bloomer, they're still like a child, and it's just... It separates them, doesn't it? Yes, yes. And the, the, the kids vary a great deal from each other in that particular regard. They certainly do. Mm. All right. So uh, how do the changes in early adolescence affect the way my, teen my teenager understands and experiences faith? I would say in terms of faith, one big implication of puberty for that is what puberty is doing in the brain. Obviously, the kids are, are starting to move from concrete thinking to abstract thinking. Well, what difference does that make at the house? One big difference it makes at the house is when you begin the process of abstract thinking, you are enamored with, you're fascinated with new abilities that you've never had before. Now you can think about thoughts. Now you can think a little bit logically. Now you can construct arguments well. 
so because because the kids are fascinated with things they've never been able to do before, they tend to do it a lot. <laughs> Some would say too much. So what mom and dad might need to, to, to understand is this kid is probably going to try to have more long, drawn-out arguments with us. I don't mean screaming and hollering, but a, a, a child, a teenager that's trying to prove his or her point of view— uh, they just tend to do it a lot, and it, it wears mom and dad out. My son told me after that stage, I was asking him, I said, Clayton, you used to get so passionate. You were so tense uh, trying to talk me into something or trying to get me to change my mind. What was up with all that? And he actually started laughing. And he said, Dad, what you don't know is, he said, a lot of times I didn't really care that much about the issue we were talking about. He said, it was just so fun to try to change your mind or to talk you into something. That was a great reminder to me that it's a developmental stage. Mm. And anytime you can do something new, you just get fixated on it and you want to do it all the time. So related to faith, same thing. I'm probably going to have some long drawn out questions, uh, discussions, push back on my faith just because my brain now can do things like that for the very first time. Mm, at, you just explained a lot to me. I was thinking my son was going to be a good lawyer one day, but now <laughs> evidently he's just fascinated with his new abilities. Okay, so let's. Uh, I think it's important in adolescence to nail the transitions, right? And so now let's talk about that transition when we go from middle school to high school. Uh, that we want to make sure that that is, and that's coming up. So again, selfishly, help me out. When, when he transitions from middle school to high school, what do I need to make sure I'm thinking about? I, th- there are two extremes parents can take. One extreme is, I don't care about you. I don't care about your world outside this home. You know, just go figure it out. Uh, the other extreme would be parents that are so hyper-concerned. They try to micromanage every piece of a, ch- a teenager's life. There, somewhere in there, there's a happy medium. I do believe that believing teenagers can go to school and hang out with pagan young people and not be destroyed by that. I I do not think a parent has to say, I'm going to micromanage every relationship. I'm going to dictate every person my teenager talks to. So I I, I think it's okay. If if parents feel like they instill faith from the get-go, I think it's okay to say, my child probably will negotiate most of that pretty well. But having said that, groups do matter. Peers do matter. What Chap Clark calls clusters is a very accurate description. The kids in high school basically are going to have three, four, five, six, seven friends. That will be kind of their world. And that does matter, and those people do have influence. So in freshman year, in sophomore year, no cars, no driver's license, one thing a parent can do that's very practical is making their house the place to be, making their house the, the hangout. And, and sometimes that involves remodeling. Sometimes that means we're going to move out some this or that, and we're going to make that room more attractive to teenagers, or we're going to get a little refrigerator, or we're going to get a pool table or something. Sometimes it's just mom and dad taking a little bit of the initiative. Hey, sweetie, would you like to have some friends this weekend? We'll stay in the bedroom, let y'all have fun. Don't mind ordering pizza in. It, parents that just nudge the fact, yeah, I recognize you want to get with your people, we would love to have them here. And, you know, the advantages are obvious. <laughs> Parents are more in touch with who's coming and going. They're more in touch with how are these people made, what's their worldview, what are their parents like. And, you know, just the bad things teenagers can do when they get bored and crazy are less likely to happen at home. So I think that's one advantage to help that kid, especially the freshman, construct the, the, the group, the world that I'm going to be a part of, and perhaps centering some of that at the house. Another thing that I think matters is this issue of extracurriculars. I will almost sound like a communist when I say this because we are so convinced that that overabundance of extracurriculars is how you grow great kids. I just happen not to believe that. Uh, I think the wise parent is doing what the teenager in high school almost can't do, and that is look for balance. The, the, the kids can't figure that out. If you happen to be good, athletically. You want to play every sport, every team. If you happen to be good academically, if you happen to be good in the arts or music, you just want to do that all the time. Mom and dad who think, I'm going to keep my kids so busy he won't have time to sin, I'm just so sorry. There is no basis for that in the least. 
And to say, I need my child in all of these activities because it's going to open all these wonderful doors in adulthood, once again, there's no evidence of that. What we get is tired kids, stressed out kids, kids sometimes even through activities that are being exposed to people that are toxic people. But the main issue is no heart connection at home. Good church people who never see their kids at the house lose a connection with that young person. And when you lose the connection, what I call the heart connection, you're losing that conduit through which spiritual influence travels. So many Christian parents, I'm probably both working these days, you know, they, they leave their respective jobs. They call each other on the cell. Who's getting takeout? I'll grab something. They walk in the house. They throw the styrofoam on the bar. Kids, kids, grab something quick. We've got practice. We've got dance. And those people never fall back in that house again until bedtime just to slip into bed. Where's the connection? So I, th I think wise parents, and I don't mean to make this sound concrete, but, but in general, they're saying, choose a sport, choose your best sport, and we'll support you 100%, we'll pay the money, we'll go to the games, but don't choose three. If you want to do dance, that's really, you can't do dance and you can't cheer. You, 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 you make choices. And so what you're creating is a little balance, some margin in that family where we still have a relationship, we send you off to college and the heart connection is still in place. I love it. What about the faith development in high school? Where does, uh, what's a natural thing for parents to be aware of and how a, a teenager grows in high school from the perspective of faith? Uh, innovative church leaders, church leaders that pay attention right now are talking a great deal about the nuns, the people that on any survey indicate no preference of any faith of any kind. Everybody's fascinated with those folk. But new research as recent as the last week or two would say that a fair percentage of the nuns did go to church childhood, teenage years, and by their report, the thing that, that bombed out in their faith development was, I had questions about my faith, I had doubts about my faith, and nobody seemed interested in answering them. That seems to be a major percentage of the nuns that have a church background. So I've decided it's just a really important issue. Do, number one, do high school students feel comfortable at church saying to their leaders, I've got some real questions. Somebody's going to have to explain to me this whole Genesis thing and what my science teacher said. And, and those kids are going to need to feel comfortable ask, asking those same questions at home. Now, mom and dad listening to a podcast today might say, well, I don't know all of those answers. Man, there's some really complicated things. The issue is not do I, as a church leader or a parent, have instant answers on, my t on the tip of my tongue? The issue is, do I take a, a teenager seriously when they begin to ask questions about the faith? Do I take them seriously enough that I say, what a great question that does not offend me, and it certainly doesn't offend God. Let's you and me go to work and find answers to your questions. No teenager in 2018 is going to ask the first question that brings the whole Christian faith crumbling down. Probably not going to happen. So I think parents can take confidence in that. The, the key seems to be a, an adult that shows respect for the question and will work with a teenager to, to resolve the question. And I think if we do that much more often, we're going to end up with a lot more college students and young adults living for Jesus, making a difference in the world. We're doing great. We've made it to graduation now. Congratulations. Uh, and, and this will be one of the last questions. The, uh, graduation, uh, how do we make sure as a parent to, I don't want to miss that. I don't want to miss that moment. I want to make the most of it as a parent. What do I need to be thinking about when my high schooler is graduating from a parenting perspective? Once again, answer may sound a little, little churchy, but I think it is the practical answer. A 17-year-old, 18-year-old that's beginning to think about ultimate things, college, career, success, all that sort of thing. I don't think they're very influenced at all by conversations at home related to, well, remember that your faith would call for you too. Remember that your religion would call for you too. Don't forget your church now and all that happens in the future. I just don't think they're very uh, impressed by that at all. I think the laser focus has got to be on Jesus. I think you keep him the center of conversation. So the issue is, son, 
as you're going through uh, major choices, as you're trying to hone this down, my challenge to you, my invitation to you is you just keep walking into the throne room of heaven. You lift your eyes to Jesus and you say, I love you so much. I respect you so much. What I really want is your will, your plan. This is for you. Same thing. As I begin to define my criteria for success, it's the same thing. When you're helping a son or daughter figure out when will I feel successful, it's the same issue. You do that in light of who Jesus is. What's his heart desire? What, why did he put you on planet earth in the first place? How do you fulfill that mission that he gave to no one else? See, all those are Jesus-centered questions. Another clear uh, part of that would be um, money, motivation. What will motivate you? You see, you're, you're wanting to create a possibility that a college student or even a not college student might say, I'm going to go to this third world environment and I'm going to serve hurting people and I probably will never have much material things and I am perfectly fine with that. But Well, why would a person come to that decision? Because it delights Jesus, because it pleases him and because I'm acting in his nature when I've got a wash basin and a towel around my waist. So I would just say to parents, keep bringing the issue back to him. Same thing on morality. In a, in a very toxic, very pagan university culture with all that's going on these days, the, the, the Christian kids in two weeks often are doing what the lost people do. Why, why would they not do that? I skate above that for the sake of Jesus. I think he's the issue. Hmm. I love it. All right, so you have a book called Youth Ministry That Lasts a Lifetime. I want to make sure uh, our listeners hear about that because there's some youth ministers here that I think would enjoy it. So tell us about that project. The, the book is a paradigm shift, overused term, but true. It is a paradigm shift in youth ministry. What I'm inviting churches, senior pastors, youth pastors to consider is viewing, quote, the youth program in thirds. A third of the budget, staff members' time, calendar dates, a third of everything being targeted to mom and dad coming alongside the home, very much in a D6 kind of way. A, a third of time being given to specific age group ministry. In other words, I still believe that you need teenagers in a room with youth leaders doing Christ-like things. I believe in that with all of my heart. So I would still call for a third of what we've been doing that, just doing it really well, biblically sound. But the newest conversation here is a third of the time given to drawing teenagers into the full congregation, giving them heart connections with a multiplicity of children, adults, even senior adults, and not just relationships, but, but moving those teenagers into the, the overall ministries of the church. If a carload of ladies go down to work in crisis pregnancy uh, on Saturday, as a student minister, I ought to be asking myself, do I have two or three high school girls that would work really well in that environment that seem to have a, a passion for that issue, and how do I connect them? Same thing with the other guys and girls. So, so you figure out what are our adults doing to express the ministry of our church, and how do we move teenagers into that process? So it, it, it's certainly moving away from silos. It is incorporating teenagers into the full church. The research says those that feel pulled in, tied to part of the full church, tend to walk in faith in much greater numbers than those that stay in the youth ministry bubble. Mm. You guys have been listening to Dr. Richard Ross, uh, and I'm so grateful that you are training the youth ministry, um, youth ministers of tomorrow. Thank you for that. Uh, if you guys want to grab the book or learn more about what he does, you can go to richardaross.com. Thank you for being with us. I've loved it. Thank you. Our team at D6 have put together top family ministry resources that will help you do family ministry well. We call it D6+. Plus an online monthly subscription for every age and stage of ministry. Adult, youth, and children's leaders can now enjoy ready-to-use family ministry resources and training from the team at D6 Family. What can you expect with D6 Plus? First, you get the D6 Conference year-round, with a media library filled with main stage talks and breakout sessions from every year of the D6 Conference. D6 Plus also provides teacher training videos and emails to help your team excel at family ministry. 
D6 Plus includes a toolbox of one-page talking sheets to guide families through pain points. D6 Plus also offers sermons and lesson outlines, countdown videos, and creative graphics. In addition to the resources and training provided online, D6 Plus members receive other perks, family ministry books sent directly to you throughout the year for free, plus special VIP benefits at the D6 Conference. D6 Plus, family ministry resources and training to help you and the parents in your church have an excellent family ministry. So our thanks go out again to Dr. Richard Ross, who, by the way, will be one of the people that we're featuring at D6 Days, the online uh, content that we're offering for free. You can sign up at d6days.com. Now, let's look at David Prince, who is that unique voice in a very specific topic. Absolutely. David Prince, again, can speak on multiple areas, but he is most known for how do Christian parents help engage the topic of sports inside their family and it not compromise their Christianity. Uh, both both my boys play sports, and I, this is just such an issue. It's mm-hmm. so hard to know how to handle a ton of these uh, different situations that come up. And to have a voice like this that's willing uh, and, and ready and has been through it uh, in, in real life and then has studied about it, so much David has to offer. And so let's just listen to him, though. He's not going to be talking as much about sports here. He's going to be more into the world of parenting. Another great one for you to share with parents. Let's listen. Hey, we want to welcome back our friend David Prince. He's with us again. Uh, David, thank you so much for being with us, sir. Glad to be here. All right. So you are a pastor at Ashland Avenue Baptist Church in Lexington, Kentucky. You're also a professor. You're an author of the book, In the Arena, The Promise of Sports for Christian Discipleship. You have uh, been kind of our sports evangelist here at D6 (laughs) for years now. Uh, I love that. I love that you speak on that topic. But today, I'd like to take just a moment and kind of pick your brain about another uh, similar but different topic. You're teaching a seminar at D6 called Parenting the authority and love dynamic. Authority and love, I'm interested in that. Would you please summarize, kind of give us some uh, nuggets and, and highlights from what you're teaching in that? Because I think we could really benefit from this. Yeah, you know, um, for years uh, in literature about uh, Christian parenting, and not only literature, but that way that is often lived out, it, observationally in my mind, there are kind of uh, two ways in which Christians tend to conceive of their idea of what it means to be a, a really uh, intentionally Christian parent. And, and one of those ways, um, both of these ways have some measure of validity in them, but they're out of kilter. Uh, one of those ways is that I get my children to obey. And uh, how I measure the fact that I'm a good and godly parent is that my children do what I tell them to do. In other words, uh, you exercise authority, and it doesn't matter uh, really how that authority comes as long as you speak and your children do what you tell them to do. Uh, but the, the danger in that is that if, if their obedience is just rooted in the authority, that, the bare authority that you're exercising over them, and it's not connected to anything else, then what's going to happen when they're outside of your authority? Uh, in other words, what your real goal in exercising authority is, is far more than immediate obedience, though it does involve you uh, telling your children to obey and holding them accountable to. But, but that's one side, the kind of parent who says almost uh, like, look, w- watch this. And they tell their kid to do something, their kid does it, or, you know, the parent says, uh, my kids memorized 86 uh, Bible verses and you're at the, somebody's house. Uh, okay, James 1, 3. You know, it's almost like a party trick, uh, which, is, which is dangerous. And, and I think that, that parents like that drift into um, their kids functioning more like a prop in a public relations campaign. And the issue with their kids' disobedience is more their embarrassment because it says they're a bad parent. Uh, when in reality it doesn't, but since they have structured the parenting narrative like that, that's what it feels like to them. Mm. Well, let's take another um, 
approach, and, and this approach usually goes under the banner of grace, grace-based parenting. Uh, listen, I'm all for grace uh, in everything we do. My whole preaching ministry is centered around gospel-centeredness and Christ-centeredness. Uh, but, but this group usually, in re- reaction to the other group, uh, they sort of uh, define parenting as what they would say is being gracious. Uh, but when you really look into it, what they are is permissive. <laughs> And they don't really have much authority over their children. And they always say that they're showing their children grace. This is, you know, I'm being gracious. I'm not being harsh. I'm not being an authoritarian. And their identity is almost that they're not being that other model. And it's almost convenient for them to put put it under the banner of grace because, uh, they get to be permissive and parents like that usually want to be seen as the good guy and the, the kind parent. And, um, but, but, but the problem is they don't get grace right. They almost treat grace like uh, grace means looking the other way and pretending like something didn't happen. That's not biblical grace. Mm-hmm. Uh, biblical grace is not God acting like we didn't sin. God acting like we didn't do the bad things we did. In fact, biblical grace is rooted in our understanding that we say we are guilty sinners uh, and that we need forgiveness. And the only way for there to be forgiveness is an actual debt to be paid for that sin by Christ. And so biblically, grace doesn't ignore injustice. It's rooted in the justice of God in the atoning sacrifice of Christ. So, So that doesn't get grace right. And the other side doesn't get authority right. Mm-hmm. And, and the reason I think that both of them get it wrong is that they see authority on one side and grace on the other side, or love is, is the term I'm using here, uh, the application of grace, uh, as a tug of war rope. And to, to the degree that you're one, you have to be neglecting the other. And so you'll have other parents who are in neither of those camps, but they're just kind of schizophrenic. (laughs) Sometimes they're harsh authoritarians and sometimes they're really permissive and and they're always changing the ground rules on their kids because, oh, I was really harsh yesterday, so I need to be gracious gracious and loving today, which really they're meaning permissive. Uh, And so they see it as a tug of war rope. So you can't be, you know, to to the degree that you're one, you're neglecting the other. Mm. The, the problem with that is that our parenting is to be rooted in the character of God. And that is a lie about the character of God. Uh, God, in his exercise of authority, never, ever abandons his love and grace. God, in his expression of grace, never abandons his authority and his commitment to justice. And so what we need to think about as parents is um, how our authority and love uh, two sides of the same coin. Uh, how, what is the dynamic relationship that allows us to really point our kids to who God is and what the gospel is really like? And so our goal as parents, first and foremost, is not obedient children, are not children that think we're cool and fun-loving. It's that we make the gospel intelligible. And I think that bare authority makes the gospel unintelligible. And I think permissiveness makes the gospel unintelligible. So rather what we're doing is, let's say we correct a child. We say, you've sinned. This is how you've sinned. Let's say we discipline that child. But that discipline is never a rejection of relationship. It's always the way to restore it. And so if you cannot discipline your child and hug your child with a smile on your face in the same window, then you're not getting the authority and love dynamic right. Mm. then you're, at, you're using your authority to uh, remove your presence, which means you are abandoning love in exercise of your authority, but that's not what you're to do. It's always to, for them to see your, your authority as an application of your love and your love as the authority that's guiding their lives. And so uh, one time, uh, best, one of the best moments of my life, my child was, a, one of my children was about six years old and um, my wife said, you know, Father's Day, write down three things about your dad that you love most about him. And of course, it was number one. Uh, he teaches me how to play baseball. Mm-hmm. It was number two. 
that he turned me into an Alabama football fan, Roll Tide. Uh, and it was number three, that he loves me enough to discipline me, mm. to correct me. And I was like, you know, I get a lot of things wrong, uh, but in, at least in that instance, that's a window into something. He saw my authority over him as an exercise of my love. That's mm. what I'm going for. Mm. Uh, you see this in a lot of ways. Um, let's say your child lies and you find it out. You have a typical situation where a Christian parent will say, I cannot believe that you would do that. And what I want to say is, you're not making the gospel intelligible. I I thought you were a Christian. I didn't know you were trying to create a Pharisee. Mm -hmm. Because that says we're not people who do things like that. Mm -hmm. You are embarrassing to our family because you're not living up to the family name. Yeah. Well, It's the exact opposite. Your child, you should catch them lying. You should say, I'm not surprised at all that you would lie. (laughs) It's a reminder not only that you've sinned, but that you're a sinner and that you need forgiveness in Christ. And he offers forgiveness. Mm. Now, I'm going to discipline you because a part of my goal in pointing you to Christ is to teach you right and wrong and that you would know what sin is. But I love you no matter what you do and whatever the discipline is and the affection And that's making the gospel make sense. It doesn't compromise authority, and it's an expression of love. That is the gospel. In the gospel, we have Christ who is both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. My goodness. Drop (laughs) mic. Man, thank you. Hey, listen, uh, I think you hinted to me that that might be the seed of a book, and I just want to... uh cheer you on. Please write that book. All right. Pray for me. Pray for me. I'm I'm planning on working on it at some point. If you guys want to follow more, uh, I think he's going to put some even more writing and all of his stuff about sports, his book in the arena. He even put some information from his sermons. DavidPrince.com is the place to go to check out all that he has to offer. Thanks so much for being with us. Great to be with you. Our thanks to David Prince and uh, Jeremy for bringing that, uh, out, you know, when we have topics that we revisit, Jeremy, you yes. know, like even the speakers, people may go, well, why do you do that? You know, Dave Ramsey is a great example of this. He doesn't talk about but one thing every stinking episode. Yes. How to deal with debt. And people just keep listening because we're at different moments and seasons in our life and it applies. Yes. Our kids keep getting older and we keep hearing this through different lenses and angles. Yes. So that's why we keep bringing you. And so many, many thanks go out to, uh, to David and Dr. Ross, uh, both of them for bringing us these topics, Jeremy, for how you interview and bringing those questions that truly do help us find what we need to find in these interviews. Yep. And we have been talking a lot this episode about D6 Days because it's a big deal and it's coming up next week. And as part of that, next week's podcast is kind of uh, mixed into it. It is. And we have two very well-known names. Yes, we do. We, I love the mixture of our guests, right? Sometimes people have heard That's of right. them. Sometimes they haven't. And then sometimes we bring on people that most people have heard. Yes, yes. And uh, But those are a little bit more rare just because That's we right. love to introduce names and people. That's a great uh, aspect of the D6 kind of movement that y'all have That's created. Correct. You're introducing That's people. Yeah. But in this next episode... We've got some names that a lot of you will know, and it's both of our guests. It that. is. It is. We have uh, Dr. Lee Strobel. Uh, no, no stranger. You know, case for Christ, case for Christianity, on and on we can go. And then we have Sadie Robertson from a and Duck Dynasty, quite an extraordinary young lady who has got wisdom way beyond her years. And uh, just in the form of a tease, so make sure uh, those names should be enough for y'all to join us. But I'll, I'll tell you that Lee tells us the story of how the man who played his father in the movie, how that actor, when the director said cut, stayed in character, came over to Lee and said something to him as his father. Mm. That's a pretty good tease, right? That is a good tease. I'm looking forward to this. Now, with Sadie, I got another one for you as well. She, I asked her very directly, I said, as a young woman in the big limelight that you've been in, you have had to have trolls and haters and people speak mean, horrible, wicked things to you. 
tell us what that was like, and she goes into detail about it. Great, great answer. So those interviews you will love, and they're just a part of our D6 Days celebration. Uh, on-demand content that we're just going to pour. Uh, hey, Ron, if we were going to put a price on this content that y'all are offering, you're not. it's not out there forever. It's a limited time. But if we were going to put a price on it, it would be in the hundreds. Yeah, uh, and absolutely. you're just giving it away. Yeah, we are. So, I mean, pe- people sign up for this kind of content, two or $300, easy, all day long, everywhere else. And it's it and and yes, there's a benefit because you get to introduce people to D six. You get to tell them about the D six conference. There's a lot of neat stuff on your end, but it is. It's I know rich. you guys. Yeah, it's got yeah. the heart of a gift. It's equipping. It is the heart of it's a gift. equipping. All right, so they can go to d six days dot com to jump in, and then if you want to hear our podcast with Lee Strobel and Sadie Robertson, come back next week. I hope you guys have a great week of ministry. You've been listening to the D6 Podcast. You can learn more about D6 at d6family.com.